On behalf of the Book Club of Washington, I would like to welcome everyone to hear John McQuillan tell us about the development of the Morgan Library under its legendary librarian, Belle Green. Like many of you, the, uh, like, uh, the Morgan Library is one of my favorite places in New York City with its magnificent baronial library of J.P. Morgan, remarkable exhibitions and expanded facilities designed by the famed architect Rinzo Piano. We have a large virtual audience today with us with over 85 signed up. This is certainly a reflection of the widespread interest in the Morgan and uh, in, the in the bibliophilic community. I want to thank uh, Jennifer Larson, who's uh, head of uh, FABS, uh, for helping to circulate information about this program, as she does with other programs of our uh, sister organizations. Uh, with a group this large, of course, questions and comments uh, should go into chat. Uh, we should have some time at the end to address them at the end, uh, at, after John has finished his presentation. And we may be able to take some live, although it's kind of, we'll, we'll see how we can handle that logistically. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to mention our last program for 2023. It is perhaps the most ambitious program, educational program in the history of our, uh, of our book club, which dates back uh, a little over 40 years now. On November 4, we're going to have an all-day event called Distinguished by Design, Handmade Books from the Medieval to the Modern. It will be an in-person event at Folio, which is more formally known as the Seattle Athenaeum. Folio is a book line quarters in Seattle, Seattle's Pike Place Market. Um, the sessions will include an introduction to medieval manuscripts by Michael Taylor, Special Collections Librarian at Western Washington University, where he teaches popular classes on the history of the book. Michael will be joined by uh, book club uh, member Matt Bray, who's I see, I think I see him on this uh, today. Who's, Mike is gonna provide the personal, uh, or uh, Matt is gonna provide the personal perspective of a collector of medieval manuscripts. We're then going to have a session on the rise of private press with uh, focus on the Kelmscott Press, Morris, uh, and the arts and crafts movement. This will be presented by Sandra Krupa, who's the longtime curator of book arts and rare books at the University of Washington. We will conclude with a lively panel of local book artists, which will show examples from their different approaches to artist books. Please check our website for more information and to register for this event. It is a good excuse to come to Seattle. Uh, so uh, for, and uh, so we'd love to have anybody uh, uh, on this call uh, decide to come and uh, participate in this uh, event. Now, let me introduce our speaker, John McQuillan. He's the Associate Curator of Printed Books and Bindings at the Morgan Library and Museum. In two, in, 2012, he earned a PhD in art history and book history as and in the print culture collaborative program from the University of Toronto. John specializes in Incanabula and early modern book history and has published um, on 15th century provenance studies, medieval and modern library history, Incanabula herbals, and uh, book portraits of the in the paintings of Hans Holbein. In his 11 years at the Morgan, John has curated exhibitions on William Caxton, Mark, uh, Martin Luther, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, 19th century French royal book bindings, Hans Holbein, and early printed herbals. John's talk today is timely um, since he's going to talk about uh, Bell Green. Uh, there, there will be a, uh, uh, the, the Morgan Library is celebrating its 100th anniversary uh, next year. And there will be a major exhibit on uh, Bell Green in the fall. Well, 
We are indeed fortunate, and I am delighted to turn the virtual microphone over to John. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good afternoon or evening, um, everyone. And I appreciate this uh, opportunity to come and speak with you all today. Um, I'll share this. Um, so uh, I started actually kind of like writing the script to this talk and was it was making me too sort of anxious um, to try and script everything I wanted to say. So um, I'm going to try and go from notes and make this a little bit hopefully more uh, loose and conversational, um, which I hope is also, you know, a little bit uh, more engaging for you all than just watching me um, read from a piece of paper. Um, so the history of the Morgan Library begins with J. Pierpont Morgan, uh, born in 1837. Uh, Morgan was the son of Junius Spencer Morgan, who founded sort of, you know, the family banking business and financial business. Um, their family was based between Connecticut and London. Of course, in the 19th century, London was the center of Western economic uh, banking and all economic development. Um, but during Morgan's day, that shifts to New York. Um, Junius Spencer was a little bit of a collector, um, not in the terms that his son was going to be, um, but he was a book collector and art collector. Um, most of that collection though did not remain in the Morgan family and was dispersed and sold um, uh, at Junius's death um, and does not kind of stay with us. Um, but Morgan, uh, Pierpont Morgan shown here, um, was an early collector. He began in his teenage years collecting the autographs of famous people, mainly US presidents, um, senators, um, those who were still living, um, but also an interest in collecting the signatures of all of these signers of the Declaration of Independence. So his interest in um, you know, historical autographs and historical manuscripts began very early. Um, these two photographs are from somewhere probably in the 1880s. Um, Junius Spencer, um, his father, died in 1890. And it was at that point that Pierpont Morgan um, became head of the banking firm, but also sort of came into his inheritance and had access to a large sum of money that really you know, began initiating his own increasing collecting interests. And so the bulk of his collecting time then um, kind of begins about in the mid 1890s. Um, Morgan's New York City home, um, this is an image of the library in his home, was at the corner of 36th and Madison. Um, Morgan, the Morgans were not home builders in the way that the Vanderbilts uh, Carnegie, Frick, kind of like the later American industrialists were. Um, Pierpont Morgan and his son, J.P. Morgan Jr., uh, purchased brownstones already that had been um, existing brownstones along Madison Avenue um, that had been built in the 1850s. Um, and at this point where they were in now Midtown Manhattan um, was very far north in Manhattan in the 1850s and 1880s. Um, and as we crest into the 1900s, Manhattan goes further north, but the Morgans remained in Midtown while the Fricks and Vanderbilts, um, James Lennox all kind of moved up to um, up Fifth Avenue near where the Metropolitan Museum of Art is now and along Central Park. Um, but you can see in this uh, image of Morgan's library, um, very few books. Um, there is a small bookcase behind this settee in the corner. You can see a little bit of it here. Um, but the display of objects, the ceramics around the fireplace and the decorative objet, uh, the framed um, artworks on top of that bookcase, um, there was already 
as is typical for uh, Victorian, you know, decoration, this kind of like display of material everywhere and how there is not much of a blank wall in this room, the ceiling, the wallpaper above the wood paneling, the windows, you know, everything has that Victorian decorative elegance that you expect to see in a home like this. Um, but it was about this time, um, uh, Morgan bought this home in uh, this brownstone in 1881. And that same year, he sort of began maybe his antiquarian book purchases in earnest. Um, that um, in 1879, at the sale of Connecticut banker George Brinley, um, he bought the Wapanog Bible, one copy of the 1663 edition um, of the Wapanog Bible, what's often called the Elliot Indian Bible, um, the Bible that uh, John Elliot kind of spearheaded through translation and publication. Um, this is the first Bible, complete Bible, printed in the North American colonies, in North America. Um, there are earlier uh, biblical books. The Bay Psalm book famously is the first kind of bit of scripture printed in the colonies. Um, but this is the first complete Bible. Um, in the Algonquin, one of the Algonquin uh, dialects. But this was Morgan's for the first big splashy rare book purchase. Um, this is 1879, and this Bible cost him $1,000. Um, the New York Times called it the crowning wonder of the sale from Mr. Binley's collection um, and came to Morgan. Um, now we have three copies of the 1663 uh, Wapanog Bible. Um, but this, you know, as Morgan uh, starts coming into his his um, more substantial sort of adult age, um, more uh, important um, roles in his family's banking interest and has more access to money, you can see where he starts to look at what are important books and artworks that he needs to start um, collecting. Um, but it was after his father's death, as I said, in 1890, that he really begins collecting in earnest. Um, and he does that with quite a splash. Um, on a lovely June day in 1896, uh, Morgan acquired his first Gutenberg Bible. Uh, this Bible is printed on vellum. Um, and as you can see here, um, with beautiful illumination that was produced in Bruges, Belgium, um, in the later 1450s to about 1460. Um, now, in terms of the Gutenberg Bible, um, a book that is, you know, very well known, is sort of referred to a lot, but what, you know, what exactly is it when we talk about the Gutenberg Bible? Um, the name Johannes Gutenberg does not appear anywhere in the Bible. There is no colophon at the end that says, you know, I, Johann Gutenberg, printed this Bible in Mainz, Germany in 1454. Um, all of that information, you know, we have gleaned from other historic references to um, various documents that cite a man named Gutenberg, um, you know, working in Mainz or in the Rhine, working on different sort of book projects and some sort of language about the work of the books and the work of letters, printing or um, uh, the in Latin, you know, generally the word is um, some form of like espresso or expresso, like to push out books. Um, but when you have that idea of um, the presso as in printing, um, rather than some sort of like scripta word for writing. Um, it is in a large, what is called textura font, commonly known as missile type, um, based upon the kind of books that usually had this kind of large, blocky, um, very square kind of font. What we often now is trimmed to become like black letter um, or like a heavy Gothic font. Um, and so there are references to, you know, books in this large missile type that started coming out that were being sought by uh, papal emissaries. 
um, and discussed at the Frankfurt Book Fair of 14, uh, uh, early in 1455, talking about, you know, multiple choirs of, you know, this large format Bible that you could read even without glasses. Um, so there's something, you know, this awe at all of a sudden having all of these books that are exactly the same or appeared to be exactly the same for sale. Um, generally, the Bible is bound into two volumes. It has 643 leaves or folio leaves. Um, and Gutenberg intentionally left space at the beginning of all of the major books of the Bible um, for large uh, initials to be added by hand, painted to the desires of the customer. Um, there is a, you know, very, you know, uh, typical way of describing early print in that they were copying manuscripts. Um, Gutenberg was trying to copy manuscript Bibles of the period that were in this large format, large script, and had painted initials. Um, I won't go into my sort of own uh, weird issues about saying about their copying manuscripts, but Gutenberg was trying to print a book that people would accept, that people would buy. Um, and so you're not going to go too far away from the norm if you're introducing a new product onto the market. You want it to be accepted. So it needed to look like what was already existing. Um, so each individual copy then of the Gutenberg Bible, once you bought it, then the buyer would pay to have the initials painted in whatever way they saw fit and to whatever financial degree they could afford. So there's a great variety in the painted initials in the Gutenberg Bible, as we will see shortly. About 180 copies of the Bible were printed originally by Gutenberg with 40 or 50 on vellum and the remainder on paper. Um, about 48 more or less complete copies of the Gutenberg Bible exist today with a further um, 12 to 15 copies represented by just leaf fragments. So only part of an entire copy has survived. Um, this Gutenberg Bible that Morgan bought, um, he acquired from the bookshop of Henry Sutheran. Sutheran um, had a bookshop that was sort of, you know, on Morgan's path between the Morgan Bank in London and his home at Prince's Gate. And Morgan became a regular visitor to Henry Sutheran. Um, but this one day in June, uh, Morgan passed through Sutheran's shop and in one fell swoop purchased uh, the Gutenberg Bible, all four folios of Shakespeare, the first, second, third, and fourth folios, um, and the Complutensian Polyglot. Uh, the Complutensian Polyglot is an early 16th century book printed in Alcala, Spain, um, between four, 1514 and 1517. Um, it is six volumes of the Bible in uh, um, kind of multiple uh, language text. So on the, on the page, you have about six different columns between Old Latin and the Vulgate Latin, um, depending on if it's the uh, Old or New Testament, um, Hebrew or Greek, the Old Testament also has a Hebrew commentary. The New Testament includes a Greek commentary, but it is sort of, um, you know, parallel column, multilingual translation, um, a massive um, scholarly and printing undertaking to print, um, you know, the Bible in multiple languages, all on, you know, matching single pages. Um, but Morgan bought all of these works in a single day in 1890, June 1896. Um, this advertisement from Southern Shop, here I'm showing you the reverse that lists um, all of the Bibles um, with our own Morgan notation showing you what Morgan bought, um, and the front uh, showing kind of the Bibles, um, this uh, photograph from Southern Shop with the Bibles displayed. As far as I know, this is the only copy of this advertisement to exist. Um, I haven't seen a uh, reference to any other one. Um, and importantly, you have the date here, June 1896. The, the advertisement may not have gone out because it was on uh, the 11th of June that Morgan made these purchases. So um, the advertisement may have been short-lived. Um, and here you can see uh, a copy of the invoice. Uh, this copy was written on the 16th of June from the 11th June purchase. 
showing Morgan's purchase for the Gutenberg Bible, often called the Mazarin Bible, uh, because of the copy in the Mazarin, libel, Mazarin Library in Paris. Um, it was identified first as an important Bible before it was associated with Gutenberg. And so um, the Gutenberg and Mazarin Bible are just two names for the same thing. Uh, the Polyglot Bible, Polyglot Bible, and then the four Shakespeare folios. Importantly, you can also see that 45 pounds was subtracted from the bill because Morgan paid cash. Um, interestingly, the original invoice um, from 11th of June uh, for this purchase, um, we let leave the building several years ago. Um, back in 1971, we actually deaccessioned the first folio, Shakespeare, um, actually it was the fourth folio, sorry, um, of Shakespeare that Morgan bought in 1896. And in that volume was the original invoice. Um, I don't know where our fourth folio is now, um, but the June 11th invoice is with a bookseller here in New York um, as a nice little trophy on his desk. Um, but this are two close-ups of the vellum Gutenberg Bible just to talk about, you know, this Bruges illumination. Um, I won't kind of go into detail here, but the style is very closely identified with that produced in Bruges uh, mid-century up until about the 1470s um, with these sort of uh, little black line uh, kind of vine stems, little flower petals with red or blue dots on the end, the gold ground initials with the blue with red highlighting, um, major initials um, is very standard for what's coming out of Bruges. And here you can see another hand in the Gutenberg Bible, um, a slightly different style, but still applicable to Bruges mid-century. Um, the main issue with this vellum Gutenberg Bible, however, is that um, six entire leaves and about, um, did I write that down? Something helpful? No. Um, six entire leaves and maybe about two dozen um, initials have been cut out and replaced in the 19th century. Um, they were replaced by this man, Adam Polinsky, a well-known artist um, at mid-century in Paris who produced a number of medieval manuscript facsimiles and printed um, facsimiles of block books and incunabula. Um, this Bible was bought uh, in Paris about 1863 by an English collector named Sir Richard Tufton, um, who had Polinsky restore the Bible. Um, we're not entirely sure why, um, because we don't know, you know, what this looked like beforehand. Um, but you can see kind of this cut line right across here with the yellow and blue stains. Everything above this line is 19th century Paris by Polinsky. Everything below is 15th century Gutenberg in Belgium. Um, so again, like if these leaves were damaged, if there was um, annotations and writing that uh, the purchaser Henry Tufton thought needed to be replaced or cleaned up, um, or if they were already missing for some reason, had already been cut out. We really don't know. Um, the there there was a big market in the 19th century for illuminated initials and borders. Um, a lot of collectors would you know just cut out initials and reassemble them scrapbook style into new manuscripts or into just albums of samples of styles of illumination and artists' hands. Um, I, I, I live, every so often I'll check through museums and library catalogs for collections of cuttings or albums of illumination fragments and kind of live in the hope someday that I'll just find, you know, all of our missing initials. Um, that could be a pipe dream, but it gives me something to do. Um, but, uh, Richard Tufton uh, purchased this Bible, again, um, from the Paris dealer in 1863. Very little is known about him as a collector, and no one uh, knew he had this copy of the Gutenberg Bible 
until his son consigned it to Southerns in May of 1896, whereon within a month it was acquired by Morgan. And here's just another example. Um, you can see, you know, the line across the top of the page replacing this entire upper margin and the illumination, but then everything below here is proper Gutenberg. Uh, Polinsky didn't really have any qualms in sort of bleeding his added illumination onto the original. Um, and you can see on this side, um, he replaced this border and then added this illumination, um, which is very unusual because illumination, the, the marginal decoration uh, tradition in medieval manuscripts, it generally has to be tied to something. It has to be anchored by an initial or some other um, substantial element. It doesn't just sort of float free in the border like this. And so that was another, you know, when you when you look at this Bible, there are a few things like this that just sort of pop out. Um, and this kind of decoration more draws your attention to Polinsky's replacements rather than, um, you know, if he, if he thought he was trying to camouflage um, this patch or not. But again, you can, um, you know, there's some there funny little replacements in this uh, Bible. Um, and here are just two further examples. You can see Polinsky's replacement, the cut line here for the new vellum, and he's outlined in graphite the initials, the bottoms of the initials that he needs to fill in, and they just never got painted in. Um, and then just to show you a detail, you can see here the difference between, you know, the black ink that Polinsky is using and the printed black ink of Gutenberg. Um, and even sort of the fuzziness of his lines that he's doing. And you can see the places where his pin nib sort of, you know, splays apart as he's doing the sketches into the two um, little like half nib. Um, and where his lines are a little bit fuzzy compared to the original 15th century decoration. And so when you start to sort of, you know, look in detail um, at this, there are elements like that that you can see where Polinsky, like, you know, these are telltale signs, even on the old vellum, where you can see them where Polinsky's gone back and tried to um, gild the lily, as it were. Um, but early on, um, starting in the 1890s, Morgan's greatest advisor, book advisor, um, was his nephew, Junius Spencer Morgan Jr., um, Junius was the son of Pierpont's sister, Sarah, um, and he was also a rare book collector. Um, and for a time, he was the assistant librarian to Princeton University Library. And today, Princeton has the bulk of Junius's book collection. He had a significant collection of editions of Virgil. Um, and so, but Junian really... Um, advised his uncle on purchases. Um, they both, you know, uh, Junius was also involved in the family banking business and between trips back and forth between Europe and the US, um, you know, whether Junius or Morgan was always able to go visit collections or booksellers to see material that Pierpont was interested in acquiring. Um, it was Junius, who started guiding his uncle towards the purchase. Um, uh, Pierpont was not really one to just go in and buy a book, even from a book dealer, as you can see with his purchase from Southern, where he picked kind of the major highlights and acquired them all at once. Um, he liked to acquire substantial collections, whether that was from an individual um, and buy an entire collector's library. Um, or booksellers who had put together sort of an entire collection of material for Pierpont to acquire. And so Southern, other London booksellers um, knew this and so would acquire, um, you know, kind of uh, collect, you know, a large collection of early English printed Bibles and try and sell that um, generally successfully to Pierpont or, um, he finally uh, finished his complete collection of all the signers of the Declaration of Independence through a book dealer intervening to be able to get every single signature. 
Um, so a lot of Pierpont's acquisitions came through these large library acquisitions, which Junius really helped um, to work on. Um, Junius was also instrumental in, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so one of these major uh, libraries that Junius helped Pierpont acquire was the private collection of Theodore Irwin. Um, Irwin was um, a collector up on up in Northern New York, up on Lake Ontario in Oswego. Um, and he was one of the substantial investors in um, the Otis Elevator Company. Um, from the Irwin collection, um, which Morgan bought in 1900, um, there are about 3, 000, over 3,000 printed books and a number of manuscripts, including this one, um, the Golden Gospels of Henry VIII, um, produced in, I have to move my little, our little windows so I can make sure I get the uh, dates right, um, produced just before the year 1000, um, at the end of the 10th century in Trier, Germany. Um, this is a very much imperial manuscript. You can see the parchment has been dyed purple, and all of the script on this gospel book is in gold. Um, it is called the Golden Gospels of Henry VIII. Um, supposedly, and the, the story has always been that um, when Henry VIII um, wrote his uh, tract against Martin Luther, um, and the Pope uh, granted Henry the title uh, Defender of the Faith, this Bible came with that title as a gift from the Pope. Um, however, uh, it's not even that recent anymore, but about 15 years ago, um, the uh, scholar James Carley was able to prove that this Bible had actually been in England long before that. So it was not a gift from the Pope, but probably something acquired by Henry VIII, um, either during the dissolution of the monasteries or shortly before as some sort of other gift. Um, but with the Irwin collection as well, um, Morgan acquired his second Gutenberg Bible. Um, this is copy was printed on paper and is just the Old Testament. Um, the earliest recorded provenance for this copy, um, there is an inscription on one of the first pages um, from 1565 uh, by, a pastor, by a pastor in Saxony, northeastern Germany, um, giving uh, this book to another pastor. Um, there are a couple of other inscriptions as it passes to kind of a local noble family um, in 1677. Um, and then given to a parish church in Kleinbautzen, uh, Saxony, um, just before the year 1700. And it was in this church in Kleinbautzen where this Bible was discovered in 1767 um, and then ends up uh, coming into uh, several pirate collectors' uh, collections before ending up with Theodore Irwin and then ultimately Pierpont Morgan. Um, you can see this copy um, underneath the gilding on the edge, you can see this sort of foliate decoration. Uh, this copy has been very much cut down um, while it was still in Germany. Um, and then this edge decoration painted on, um, but the later gilding sort of covers that up. So it's hard to see any details, but only when the book is open and the pages are sort of splayed like you would for four edge painting, um, can you see a little bit of this decoration? Um, but it's still so covered up that we can't, you know, identify it clearly. I think it's 18th century Germany, um, but it, it's hard to tell from what we can kind of see here. Um, when Irwin uh, purchased this copy, when Theodore Irwin purchased, purchased this copy, he then had it rebound and conserved by a binder here in Brooklyn, New York, named William Matthews. Um, Matthews was one of the founding members of the Grolier Club here in New York. 
Um, and the first, um, he was an immigrant from Scotland, but the first uh, bookbinder to bring sort of the tradition of like high European, like bibliophilic bookbinding to America. Um, but in uh, 1885, the same year that William Matthews rebound and conserved this copy for Irwin, he gave a lecture to the Grillier Club on the art of bookbinding um, and had something to say which impacts very much the condition of this copy. Uh, Matthews said, quote, if, as in many old volumes, the impressions of the type are heavy, the leaves should be damped and pressed in smooth boards. For the permanent solidity of the volume, beating is the best process to obtain it. The workman takes eight to 10 sheets in his hand with a hammer of 12 to 14 pounds weight in his right hand and brings successive blows on the sheets on a solid block of stone or iron. After this, the sheets in thin sections must be pressed for 24 hours in smooth boards in a screw or hydraulic press, end quote. It's interesting that in the 19th century, the idea of having the paper still with a heavy type impression was not what was desirable to collectors. Having the paper be smooth and have the book, uh, the book block, the paper itself be in a very solid uh, mass was what was considered um, in fashion and the appropriate way uh, for the book to be and look. This is very different to the way uh, we think of this now. Um, but this volume was treated exactly in this way. Um, it is a very, when closed, um, it is a very solid block of paper. Um, the paper does not, um, is not cockled. Um, in fact, you know, any texture in the paper really has been beaten and pressed out of it. Um, but one of the most important aspects of this copy that thankfully Matthews did not seem to uh, eradicate, um, there are a few uh, compositor's marks in the Irwin uh, copy. And these you can see here, um, the little sort of pound sign, almost hashtag mark between Congregati and Sunt here in the Psalms, the kind of highlighted, so you'll notice it more clearly here in the uh, interlinear. Um, these compositor's marks are from the 1462 Bible printed in Mainz by Johann Fust and Peter Schuffer. Uh, Peter Schuffer had been Gutenberg's assistant and Fust was the financier for the Gutenberg Bible. Um, after the Gutenberg Bible had been printed, Fust, um, you know, wanted to reclaim his investment that he had made uh, in Gutenberg's printing endeavor. Um, and part of that reclaiming of the investment was several copies of the Bible, probably. Um, but he also ended up joining forces with uh, Gutenberg's assistant, Peter Schiffer. Um, and Schiffer married Fuss' daughter as well, just to make sure it all stayed in the family. Um, but you can see for this compositor mark between here, Congregati and Sunt, you can see the end of the psalm here in the 1462 Bible ends here at Congregati. Um, and so this copy of the Gutenberg Bible and another copy that is uh, from uh, Burgos in Spain have these compositor marks uh, throughout. So at least those two copies of the Gutenberg Bible had been unsold, were still in, ended up in Fust and Schuffer's shop before 1462, so they could use those sheets to then make up their copy of the 1462 Bible. Um, it would have been after this point then in 1462, probably that the Irwin Gutenberg copy sheets would have been decorated and then sold on. Um, and here you can just see a little bit more of Matthew's work, um, this um, extraordinary, very sort of Jean Grelier design inspired um, binding on a uh, decorated gilt and strap work cover um, that he added to the Gutenberg. Um, and in the receipt to Irwin, he even speaks about the gilding, um, how neatly it was done quote, preserving the decoration underneath. Um, it's interesting that, you know, preserving and yet hiding it entirely, really. 
um, seems a little bit of an oxymoron, but. Um, and here just, um, you can see then, you know, this offset from this illuminated initial U over here on this page, this is from when Matthews had wet, um, had dampened and then pressed and beat the sheets in individual bifolia. Um, a lot of the illumination then gets offset onto the facing leaf. Um, and you can see like your normal sort of nested choir of how books are put together with all the bifolia sort of stacked up is how, you know, they are bound in the Bible. But when Matthew separated them out um, to, to damp and beat them and press them, they're done in individual bifolia. Um, and so then, you know, you'll have offset between these two leaves and between these two leaves. And so when they're back in bound order, the offset doesn't make sense because it's not always what's on the facing leaf. Um, once they get rearranged back into this order. Um, and so it kind of took me a minute to figure out like, why is there offset on this leaf that does not show the facing leaf? But it's because of, you know, Matthews did this damping and uh, pressing process in individual bifolia rather than in choirs. Um, and you can also see here some of the other damage that's happened to this Bible. It has significant uh, wormhole damage um, throughout that gets worse as it always does at the beginning and the end. Um, and this is just a little bit about the decorator of this Bible. Um, the artist that produced these initials throughout the border foliate and these very sort of foliate um, initials is an artist that has been called the Fust Master. After both uh, Johann Fust but a lot of the illumination has these sort of little twigs, uh, this twig or little branch motif in them, which in old German are called fusts. Um, and so both the twig, perhaps relating to Johann Fust, um, most of the um, imprints from the Fust and Schiffer shop that include this Fust illumination are vellum, uh, imprints on vellum. Um, and here are two copies of the 1462 Bible, one from the Scheide Library at Princeton, and then the Morgan's copy where you can see, you know, um, not only, you know, similar hand, but following a very similar format, particularly with these two, um, you know, intersecting leaves in the intercolumn, the style overall of the F initial, the overall path is sort of the curls that these border initials take. Um, you know, the artist was kind of following a format um, and then another uh, edition uh, that we have at the Morgan with the same um, artist. Um, uh, several years ago, um, a scholar, uh, Mayumi Ikeda, published a series of articles kind of talking a lot on, and worked extensively on this artist, the other works that the artist produced. Um, but it's a very short-lived career, most predominantly for the Fust and Schiffer uh, workshop. Um, there's not too many other manuscripts um, uh, or, or incunables, um, with this illumination on them that are not tied directly to the Fust and Schiffer shop. So it seemed a very, um, uh, singular artist, um, and ultimately sadly short-lived artist, um, who illuminated a number of these incunabula. Um, ultimately, um, when Morgan, uh, purchased the Irwin collection in 1900, Again, it was a, a little over 3,000 books, but included the Gutenberg. Um, he paid $225,000 for the entire collection, which is a little bit over $6 million in today's money. Um, it was an incredibly important collection for Morgan and um, kind of one of the foundations, particularly for the printed books department, um, where I am, um, but shows kind of how the interest Morgan was in sort of like a little bit of sort of like mass acquisition um, and not sort of individual like choice purchases. Um, but in uh, 1901 is sort of, you know, after about 10 years of Morgan kind of becoming head of the Morgan Bank, um, he's really kind of coming into his finances, as it were. Um, and around 1900 begins sort of the major 
acquisitions um, that make the foundations for the Morgan Library today. Um, not only the Irwin collection, um, but a few other uh, specific pieces, including this, the Lindau Gospels, one of the most magnificent uh, medieval jeweled bindings, um, and also a rare kind of one-off singular purchase for Morgan um, that Junius helped orchestrate in 1901. Um, the manuscript inside is a gospel book that we have recently digitized, produced, uh, written in France, about uh, written in St. Gall, um, about 1880. Um, although this front cover, you know, was put on later, but it's sort of like an earlier creation. So it must have been on another book at some point and then got transferred to this uh, St. Gall manuscript um, and produced in France about 870. Um, gilt, um, repoussé work showing the crucifixion, um, but surrounded by all of this filigree and set gemstones, cameos. Um, in this horizontal image, you can see a little bit of the depth of this creation. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of the most famous books um, in our collection, um, and one of the things that's in, you know, for me, coming out of medieval art history, you know, every medieval art history textbook, um, you know, starts off, you know, with the Lindau Gospels, um, because of just the truly spectacular survival and absolute, you know, like, ultimate level of sort of uh, luxurious book binding that this is, and really reflects the medieval practice of having the book um, particularly on gospel books and religious books, be incredibly elaborate and decorative, kind of the visual evocation of the power of the word that was contained in the text inside. Um, for a lot of these gospel books, like the Lindau, you know, the text inside was never read. It was not part of a liturgical service. The book, the binding is what, you know, the book in its binding is what sat on the altar as this visual evocation of the authority of God's word. Um, but the book itself, the text itself, was not necessarily used in service. Um, it was more a representation. Um, in 1902, just after this, uh, Morgan acquired the collection of Richard Bennett. Uh, Richard Bennett was a Manchester uh, manufacturer. Um, very little is known about him. There are no photographs. Um, there is almost nothing known about his entire life. Um, but Morgan acquired, he had, uh, Bennett had a printed book collection um, and some about a little over a hundred medieval manuscripts and almost 800 15th and 16th century printed books um, that Morgan acquired again in one single purchase in 1902. Uh, this purchase alone had 24 William Caxton imprints in it. Caxton was the first English printer um, and, uh, a real, you know, um, high spot for a lot of book collectors in England and then coming to America, um, you know, for the interest in sort of the development of English printing, Caxton was as important as Gutenberg. Um, and most, you know, early American collectors, if you were looking at Incunabula, you know, you wanted to have Gutenberg and you wanted to have Caxton. Um, this goes for James Lennox, one of the kind of founders for New York Public Library, collectors from Library of Congress, the Huntington in California. You know, a lot of these collections, you know, look for those two very important high spots. Um, and then it, um, after Morgan's uh, purchase of the Bennett collection, he started to think seriously about building a building to house his growing book collection. Um, his books at this point were spread between his home in London, um, not really any in his in his house in New York, but he had storage at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and at the James Lennox Library. Um, uh, he stored a lot of books in uh, the Lennox basement. Uh, the James Lennox Library was where the Frick Collection is now at 70th and 5th Avenue. Um, but it's about this time, 1902, that Morgan starts to consider the need to have his own library building. And this is just an early plan um, that was never made. 
um, that Morgan did not like um, from Whitney Warren, who was the architect for Grand Central Terminal. Um, but you can see from this design, it looks like the Petit Palais in Paris. It's looking a little bit more to that Beaux-Arts style um, of architecture, um, which Morgan did not uh, particularly go for. And ultimately, of course, what was chosen was a design by uh, Charles McKim of McKim, Mead & White, kind of the most famous, you know, Gilded Age uh, New York architecture firm um, that Morgan had had been familiar with. Um, Charles McKim also designed the American Academy in Rome, for which Morgan was a large financer. Um, so he knew McKim's work well. Um, and this is one of the planned drawings uh, by Houston Hawley um, for McKim, Mead & White, um, showing, you know, basically the design that came to be uh, the Morgan Library today. Um, I think it is interesting to point out that um, the building is on a short pedestal, but not, you know, so elevated. It is, you know, for as grand as it is, it is on a more human scale, um, not quite so elevated, um, but within kind of the confines of, at the time, what was very much a residential neighborhood in New York. Um, uh, this is the front of the library from a few years ago. Um, when was this? I didn't put my little caption on here. Um, but I think this was done, um, about, uh, 2015, um, in the middle teens, if I'm, uh, correct. Um, but you can see, you know, it, it looks, you know, fine at the moment. Um, but there is a lot of darkening of the stone. There is some moisture damage and some things were happening to the building. Um, and over the last several years, we've done a complete exterior restoration of this, returning the uh, what's called Tennessee marble, but um, is Tennessee pink limestone, um, back to its original sort of brilliance um, and making sure that a lot of the stonework um, and even restoring you know, the balustrade that goes around the property um, making sure that it's secure and returning it to its sort of original um, condition. Um, and here is sort of uh, the cleaned version um, uh, taken uh, in the last couple of years. Um, just to give a sense, uh, I'll say also that the garden here along 36th Street is now open to the public. Um, it never has been before, not since Morgan's day could visitors go out there. Um, but it is now there are, um, there's a garden path and planting. So you can actually see, you know, and come up onto the portico, the front of the Morgan library um, and kind of, you know, in, uh, come up to it a little bit as originally intended. Um, when Morgan was, you know, looking to build a library, um, he also was starting to look for a librarian. Um, his nephew, Junius Morgan, um, again, the assistant uh, librarian at Princeton, um, had a very capable assistant in Bell Green. And Junius recommended this young woman to uh, his uncle um, to help him with his collection. Um, and so Morgan uh, hired Bell Green about 1905. She started working for Morgan that summer uh, cataloging the books that were on uh, in storage for him up at the Linux library. Um, and so she has, you know, there's there's in the archives a few letters from 1905 back to Junius talking about, you know, how wonderful the books are, how great this opportunity is. Um, but it is, you know, Belle Green who really comes to, you know, make the Morgan um, what it is today. And here I'm just showing you a photograph of her from 1910. And actually a fairly recent um, acquisition that we made just before the pandemic, um, this 1925 uh, terracotta bust by the artist Joe Davidson, um, no one knew actually existed. Bell never set for a portrait uh, by this artist. Um, he made portraits of famous people from photos in magazines. Um, and so, you know, Bell, no one in her family, no one at the Morgan ever knew about this until it came up for auction. Um, and there are so few images of Bell that exist. Um, we knew, you know, we needed to acquire this for the Morgan. 
Um, and this bust is now on permanent view um, in the library room for the, in the McKim building, you know, the collection, you know, looking over the collection again, that she helped so much to build. Um, usually, you know, we talk about our founders as being, being Pierpont Morgan and his son, J.P. Morgan Jr. Um, but in that, I think you also have to include Belle Green because she's the one who, you know, took their, you know, private book collections and made it really into a library and ultimately now into a museum. Um, and had, you know, incredible impact upon the collection. Um, there are letters in the archives because of, you know, Pierpont's acquisitiveness and his tendency to go, you know, just buy lots of material from booksellers. Um, it then came down to Bell Green once the material came to New York to send things back. Um, and there are a lot of letters to booksellers just saying, nope, this is not good enough for his collection. Um, she had a very specific idea on, you know, she understood what he wanted and was going to make sure that he got that and that nothing, you know, of Morgan quality um, did not make it in. Um, the designs for uh, McKim's designs for the Morgan, um, again, sort of as opulent and grand as it is, um, keep it very much on a little bit more personal scale. Um, this is an early watercolor for um, the East Room, the main room of the library um, that has just the single row of bookcases and was to have either tapestries or painted walls above and then the decorative ceiling. Um, and this is what, you know, was being built. And you can see the backs of the bookcases here along the front, a plain wall above, windows around this large fireplace. Um, but once, you know, I think between Junius, uh, Morgan and Bell Green, you know, kind of looking at what Pierpont had in his collection and then looking at the plans for the library, they realized one row of shelves is not going to be enough for the collection that you have. And so they added on the two floors of bookshelves above that, um, which also changed, you know, a little bit the shape of the room. Um, you can also see this decorative molding above the fireplace that was attached to the wall had to be removed for this large tapestry for the Triumph of Avarice to fit in behind uh, the fireplace mantle. Um, and you can see the two upper floors of bookcases that were added, covering up the windows that were on either side of the fireplace um, to, to be able to fill, you know, the uh, growing Morgan collection. Um, these photos are from uh, several years uh, later, probably into the 30s or 40s, so not, you know, directly after um, construction. Uh, coming into the building, but more once we were um, after 1924, when we became um, a, a public institution rather than a private book collection. Um, and the display was always sort of, you know, the material sitting around. There were large tables in here for display of collection items. Um, but back in the day, this is where researchers would come to actually look at the books um, if you had an appointment with Morgan or Bell Green. Um, up in the ceiling, um, this beautiful, like, painted decorative cove ceiling um, by the artist Siddons Mowbray. Um, you know, there's both uh, molded uh, stucco work and individual paintings. Um, there are uh, these half circles with figures of sort of like the liberal arts, uh, comedy, drama, history, architecture, painting, poetry, um, representing kind of aspects that are in the collection. Um, and between those, then there are important figures in those areas. Um, and so this is a portrait of William Caxton um, here between history and music, um, representing the idea of printing. Uh, the original design for the ceiling had a portrait of Gutenberg here. But about the time that the two upper floors of the library shelving were added, um, this Tondo was cut away and replaced um, than we think with the uh, portrait of Caxton. So it seems that Gutenberg, you know, may have been originally in the building, um, but after Morgan's acquisition of the Bennett collection with these 34 uh, 
uh, 24 Caxons that came, um, you know, that plan might have been shifted a little bit to place more focus on Caxton than Gutenberg. Um, Siddons Mowbray, you know, painted a book in his hands, but this is certainly not one of Caxton's imprints. This is very much sort of a manuscript kind of thing. Um, and I've yet to, you know, this is a, a very generalized portrait, but one based upon a lot of um, uh, most commonly used engraving, kind of the made up uh, image of William Caxton that was most uh, in vogue around 1900. Um, the West Room Morgan Study, again, kind of similar design to the original designs for the East Room. Uh, low single floor bookcases with large tapestries and um, wall decoration above. Um, and then this is during construction of the West Room. Um, you know, the floors are covered up, but you can see the short bookcases, everything already with books in them, even though the building is still under construction. The books were on site. Um, the walls are covered in a uh, silk brocade with the armorial emblems of the Medici, um, this sort of uh, you know, the beehive, kind of tiered beehive um, Medici emblem and the star of the Kiji family, two important Italian Renaissance banking families. Um, and this is, you know, it is Morgan. There was a bank vault that originally was to store the medieval manuscripts and important literary manuscripts. Um, this is the inside of the bank vault with the manuscripts um, in storage. Um, and the Golden Gospels of Henry VIII set out on a table. Um, this photo was probably taken um, in the 19 teens. And like the other photographs a little bit later from the late 20s, 30s or 40s, it's hard to tell. Um, but the West Room, when it was sort of public museum facing and a lot of the material was just on display um, uh, for the public uh, to be able to visit, um, this was not you know, the way Morgan would have had it in his day when he was still active, of course. Um, there, there would have been art displayed on the top of the bookcases, but sort of the table in front of the bookcases and some things and the central table, you know, of course, was not the way it was for Morgan. Um, and just in color, again, you can see the bank vault with material in, um, and again, just sort of material displayed around, probably done more for uh, photographic reasons than you know, the true display of uh, how things were. Um, and this is, for those of you who have read Personal Librarian, um, the book that figures very prominently um, in that story, uh, Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur, printed by William Caxton, uh, which Morgan acquired from the sale of the Robert Ho Library. Um, you know, it, Personal Librarian sort of um, makes this book seem like it's some sort of secret as to where it was, um, but it was very well known where it was. Robert Ho um, was kind of about the generation before Morgan um, and an almost more prolific book collector than Morgan. Um, also one of the founders and the founding president of the Grillier Club. Um, his collection was well known. It was well known that the Mallory was here in New York in Ho's library. Um, so it wasn't some sort of secret that, you know, Bell needed to find out. Um, but it was very important to be sure that this volume was acquired for the Morgan Library. Um, when Ho Robert Ho's library came up for sale, there was great interest um, that this copy returned to England. Uh, the British Museum, you know, and the British government had a strong interest in that happening. And yet Bell had other things in mind. Um, and paid $50,000 for this one book, um, which, you know, we have here an example from uh, the World Magazine, um, part of the uh, the New York World uh, newspaper. Um, Bell was, you know, not a, not a society darling by any means, um, but because she was a young woman, you know, she had Morgan's ear and she had Morgan's checkbook. Um, she made the news quite a lot. Um, and the fact that, you know, she paid, Morgan paid, but she was authorized to spend that much money for one book, um, you know, made headlines across the U.S. and um, in Europe, where this same image, you know, was re uh, reprinted numerable times. 
Um, and that's uh, this is the same period when you have um, satirical magazines like Puck uh, commenting on Morgan, showing him with this great dollar sign magnet, sucking all of Europe's treasures back to New York City um, with the very newly built Empire State Building behind him. Um, you know, a few books in here, but just showing how extensive Morgan's collection was, um, you know, the books really uh, are a very small part of the artwork, sculpture, uh, medieval metalwork um, that he was acquiring. Um, a lot of the medieval uh, metalwork and sculpture is the foundation for the medieval collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. A lot of the old master paintings um, and later material uh, were sold at Morgan's death to help pay um, the inheritance taxes and form um, you know, the basis for a lot of other collections across the US. Um, the Frick collection, Andrew Frick was a heavy purchaser at the Morgan um, Old Master painting sales and a lot of the Frick collection is former Morgan material, but you can find former Morgan works, um, as I said, in museums across the country. Um, but it was kind of the, as I mentioned, like the two Gutenberg Bibles that Morgan already had, the vellum copy with the 19th century kind of facsimile leaves added, and then the paper Old Testament, um, that it, just the Old Testament, and that has, you know, a certain amount of water damage, um, were kind of seen, you know, even though they are two Gutenberg Bibles, you know, not quite good enough for the Morgan Library. Um, and so in 1911, Bell was able to sort of, as well, I think, spearhead uh, the acquisition of our third Gutenberg Bible um, through. This is the former uh, Mark Masterman Sykes, uh, Henry Ward Perkins, and Henry Huth copy. It came up for auction in London in the Henry Huth um, sale of 1911. Um, it is a complete copy on paper, not missing anything, nothing in facsimile. I say we're missing one blank leaf, but it is textually complete. So, um, and so this was, I think, you know, Bell Green realized, you know, the condition of the other two copies and that this was really a must have for Morgan. Um, and their instructions to the bookseller, um, Bernard Alfred Quaritch, the son of Bernard Quaritch, the founder of the Quaritch bookselling firm, um, that he was, he was, you know, at no costs, you know, spare no expense, except don't go over 7,000 um, pounds, you know, but do everything you can to acquire this for us. Um, and Quaritch did have to sort of, I almost said threaten, not really threaten, but warn off a couple of other collectors that he, he said that he was, uh, you know, his purchaser was, had authorized him to go up to more than Bell actually authorized him to do which scared off another American collector. Um, and so Quartz was able to acquire this for Morgan under the 7,000 um, pound limit. Uh, but you can see this sort of, you know, very pinwork, this like filigree pinwork decoration that kind of spider webs throughout the margins, um, very different than the other two copies, uh, primarily red and blue sort of decorated initials, there's no gold, there's no figural work. Um, it's a very unusual style of decoration. Um, and I was able a few years ago to figure out that this decoration comes from the monastery of Kirschgarten by Worms, just south, um, back down the Rhine um, from Mainz, right outside the city of Worms. Today, it's basically a suburb. Um, from the Windesheim, uh, kind of an Augustinian reform monastery uh, there in Kirschgarten. Um, and you can see here two examples. Uh, this is a manuscript from Kirschgarten, and you can see the comparison of the two decorative styles. Um, this sort of strange leaf emblem that kind of looks like um, a roasted chicken or an unroasted chicken, as it were. Um, you know, you have here in the same way on this sort of crosshatch background, these little marginal like circles and little tendrils you have out here. Um, these kind of big S curves that end in an arrowhead you have here. Um, you know, these little rows of pearls, like all the decoration makes sense. Um, that this, uh, our Gutenberg Bible um, was likely um, decorated in Kirschgarten. 
one of the sort of problems with that um, is that Kirschgarten was destroyed in 1525 during the German, what's called the German Peasants' Revolt. Um, but um, several of their books um, passed into other monasteries before that, thankfully. Um, but there's literally like five or six manuscripts that exist still that have been attributed to Kirschgarten. Um, this one at the Vatican is the only one that shares decoration with our Bible. Um, and Kirschgarten was related, um, uh, helped to reform uh, the monastery of Rebdorf near Eichstätt in Bavaria, even sending them books. And so my sort of theory is that this Gutenberg Bible was one of the books that got sent to Rebdorf to help reform it, which preserved it when Kirschgarten was then ultimately destroyed. Um, you know, and, and this volume might have gone the same way and gotten out into another monastery um, before Kirschgarten was then uh, decimated. Uh, and this is the volume that is always on, uh, one of these two volumes from this copy is the one that's always on display in the library. Um, two, uh, I forget which issue it was, a week or two ago in the New Yorker, um, we had given a tour to the two composers and authors of the new Broadway musical, Gutenberg, the musical, um, about two guys writing a musical about Gutenberg who know nothing about him other than, you know, the Wikipedia page. Um, and so they want to, you know, we, of course, it's like part of what, you know, we do as curators is talk about the collection, whether that's to, you know, interested collectors, school groups, or people who write musicals about something in our collection. Um, so they came to see this and there was an article um, in the New Yorker sort of about the visit um, where I call this our good copy um, because it is, you know, in great condition. Uh, the paper is spectacularly white. Um, you know, nothing has, it, it has not been soaked and pressed and beaten. Um, it has even, you know, though it's gone through several bibliophile collectors' hands who could have done horrible things to it, the paper has not been trimmed. It has a lot of the original edge, um, you know, but it is very clean. It is very bright. It shows really well. So this is, this is our good copy um, of the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and just to show you like our three copies and why the Morgan has three copies. This is the same leaf out of each. This is the beginning of the parables of Solomon. Um, you know, the text, you know, it's all the same Gutenberg black printed text, um, but three completely different histories. Um, not only in how they look in terms of the artists that decorated them, um, even though that's, you know, you know, really key to knowing where these books have gone is first by the artistic hands that decorate the margins and fill in initials. Um, you know, none of these have, you know, an inscription from 1460, 1470, 1500 saying, you know, this book is in this library. So we don't know that. We only know sort of the decorative hand is the earliest bit of provenance that we know. Um, so begin again, we have the vellum copy that has all of these restored facsimile uh, uh, bits and pieces. You can see the entire, the text is Gutenberg, the entire border and this initial I is all Paris, 19th century, the Adam Polinsky part. Um, the Irwin copy that is just the paper Old Testament with the water damage by Theodore Irwin. Um, and you can also see here, I'll go back for a second, you know, the, I tried to make sure these images were all about the same in terms of the size of the text page. Um, but you can see how much from the Irwin copy was cut down of the paper when this work was trimmed. Not only do you lose like a good chunk of the illumination, um, you know, but you can see maybe because of water damage or something fraying edges, um, you know, how much of that paper was trimmed probably in the 17 or 1800s in Saxony before this uh, copy came onto the markets. Um, but the importance of the Irwin copy, again, is that this was actually in Fust and Schuffer's shop in 1462, um, where they used leaves of this as the copy text to print their Bible, um, after which then this copy would have then gone out on sale 
um, someone was still, you know, either either given this book or it was purchased. Um, and then the good copy, uh, the complete copy on paper, purchased in 1911 uh, from the monastery of Kirschgarten and one of the very few remnants of that now destroyed um, monastery. Um, for all of the, you know, marketing and press uh, that, you know, surrounds Morgan and how, you know, both the most prominent, almost the most prominent American kind of at turn of the century, really. Um, uh, a very famous portrait by Edward Steichen of Morgan. Um, this is the first state of that photograph. You can see how dark it is. Um, the darkness was one of the problems, um, but also the fact that the way the chair handle that Morgan is clasping um, is highlighted makes it look like he's holding a knife. <laughs> which was not too popular at the time. Um, Morgan also didn't like how sort of bulbous his nose looked. Um, and so the photograph was uh, redeveloped. Steichen worked on it to lighten it and to kind of work on the nose a little bit. Um, but this original state, um, Edward Steichen gave to Belle Green. Um, so this is the photograph she had of Morgan and on the reverse in her own hand, she has written Belle de Costa Green, her most precious possession. Um, I realize it's a little bit um, hard to read. And this is the inscription from Steichen uh, to Green um, with apologies, but cordial compliments from the author. Um, but she had, you know, as, as is sort of represented in uh, the personal librarian, you know, a very close relationship with him because again, she had to know what he wanted, uh, working together very closely, but I think she could also sort of mediate, you know, his, you know, vast collecting interest to sort of refine it a little bit. Um, and so in the collection, you know, we also have archival documents from the Morgan family. Um, and this is the prayer book that Pierpont Morgan always carried with him and the one that he had um, in Rome in March, 1913, uh, that he used at Easter, Easter services um, just before he died. Um, and this is the note uh, that Belle Green wrote and put in the book um, when it came back to the Morgan and she retained it uh, for the collection as part of the family's archive. Uh, Belle's handwriting, her librarian hand is very distinctive. Uh, she has a very different sort of personal writing hand. Um, but in library school, she was taught library hand. Um, and, you know, again, Belle is making headlines um, because it was a very much a concern, like, you know, this young woman who, you know, worked for Morgan, now that he's dead, what's going to become of her? Uh, but J.P. Morgan Jr., when he inherited the collection, um, Belle stayed on as his librarian. Um, and she actually was... Uh, J.P. or Jack's librarian um, for a little bit longer than she had been Pierpont's. Um, but you can see, I mean, she's still, as I said, making headlines in her book-lined office um, and very much a sort of concern, you know, what's going to happen to this woman now that she's, you know, so famous in New York society. So famous that... Um, the rumor is, the story is, um, she would wear, you know, large hats with a significant feather uh, to auctions. Um, and that a lot of booksellers, if they saw that feather coming, they would just be like, there's no reason to even buy anything at this auction um, if we know she's here. Um, but Bell was Jack's librarian um, until 1924 when uh, Jack gave, uh, you know, his what had, he had inherited as his private book collection um, to the state of New York, and it became a public institution. And Bell Green became the first director of the Pierpont Morgan Library in 1924 um, until her retirement in 1948. Uh, this photograph of her was taken about uh, 1948. Um, there seemed to have been a series uh, kind of uh, photos like this, like set up her kind of pretending to work or look at a book as some sort of, you know, a uh, record and monument to her time there and to commemorate her retirement. Um, and so this is um, 
you know, one of the very few uh, photographs of Bell, particularly from later in life, sitting behind Morgan's desk in his study, um, looking through material. Um, but again, she spent, you know, really her life at the Morgan from 1905 to 1948, um, longer than either Morgan's or anyone else. Um, she really is sort of the builder of the library and the collection. Uh, the Morgans bought books, but she chose books. Um, and, you know, within two years of retiring as Morgan's librarian, she passed away um, for someone really who who dedicated their life to an institution. Um, you know, she was uh, more so than Morgan's in some way, you know, the Morgan Library. Um, I will say the, uh, I kind of thought about this the other day, this could be silly, I don't know, but um, this is sort of starting to wrap up a bit and then we can go to questions. Um, at the exterior of the library are these two Abyssinian lionesses uh, designed by Edward Clark Potter, who also did later the large male lions in the front of New York Public Library. Um, but uh, the female lions came first. Um, maybe not quite as imposing as the male lions at New York Public, um, but it kind of occurred to me, um, it, it was very uh, pretentious fitting uh, for Morgan and McKim to decide to have female lions guarding the entrance to the library because it was Belle Green who took care of this institution for so many years. Um, and, you know, it, oddly enough, um, for a 20th century New York American institution, um, we have been, you know, wonderfully steered by women for a number of years. Um, not only Belle de Costa Green, um, but also Felice Stamfle was the first curator of the drawings department and Edith Parada, the first curator for the ancient seals and tablets, the Babylonian collection. Um, and here I'm showing you just three snapshots from the Morgan's website with some more resources that we have up. Um, I also have uh, kind of like a list of resources. They're all from the Morgan's website. Um, but to go and find um, further information, both on Bell and other aspects of the architecture and the collection, um, but a, a uh, just kind of like the history of Belle de Costa Green as the Morgan with additional resources, including links to books on her and other um, uh, publications. Um, Belle de Costa Green and the Women of the Morgan was a small exhibition put together last year by our uh, Belle de Costa Green fellow, Erica Chalela, who is working um, extensively on the upcoming Bell Green exhibition. Um, this includes a lot of archival material, but there's a couple of videos and some things um, on our website. And then a presentation that several curators did back during uh, the kind of height of the pandemic when we were all sitting at home looking for things to do on YouTube. Um, the Women Who Made the Morgan about Bell Green, Felice Stanfley, the drawings curator, and Edith Prada, the seals curator. Um, I would also add to that that um, the Morgan has always had a female bookbinder on staff from about 1905 until to the 40s, during really during Bell's tenure. Um, the person who rebound a lot of books and manuscripts for Morgan was Marguerite Dupre Leahy. Um, and then we've had Charlotte Ullman, and then last uh, most recently, um, Deborah Evitz, who is head of our conservation department uh, from the 60s, 70s um, up through the 90s. Um, so we've always, you know, um, ironically for, you know, an institution like the Morgan have done fa fairly well by being uh, helped and steered and directed by women. Um, and I'll say this for, you know, as a, a point to future resources, um, a lot of what I've gotten about Morgan's early collection in life comes out of this book, J. Pierpont Morgan's Library, Building the Bookman's Paradise, that came out uh, earlier this year, um, that you can get from Amazon, if you must, the Morgan Bookshop um, online or your local bookseller. Um, there are essays in there on the history of the architecture 
um, a lot of archival work went into tracing all of the workmen um, who did the actual stone carving, not just sort of the artists and architects that are often named, um, and sort of a history of the building, really, more so than the collections. Um, and as Gary sort of mentioned, uh, next year will be the 100th anniversary of the Morgan as a public institution from the 1924 Jack Morgan kind of charter. Um, and for that anniversary in the fall of 24, uh, we're going to have a large two gallery exhibition, Bell de Costa Green, A Librarian's Legacy. Um, a lot of new archival research has been done on Bell Green, her family. Um, there have been some more photos of her discovered, her education, how actually she came to the Morgan. Um, and so, you know, there'll be a lot. There's a catalog and publication for that, as well as an exhibition that will be up for almost six months, six, six months. Um, which is a little bit unusual for us. Most exhibitions last three and a bit. Um, but considering the importance of this topic, um, we're making kind of a special thing out of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, mark your calendars or, or keep a lookout uh, at the end of next year for that publication um, and the Morgan exhibition. And you'll learn probably more than you ever wanted to know about Belle Costa Green um, and her impact upon the Morgan's collection. Thank you very much. But John, thank you so much. Uh, I always wondered why to own more than one Gutenberg uh, Bible. And uh, now I know uh, because they're all different. Um, um, it's not just the 42 line Bible and it's not, you know, just those two the differences. It's all the illuminations then that uh, really create the differences between plus obviously um, uh, the completeness of the, of the, uh, of the books themselves. But, but uh, wow, what a great, what a great explanation uh, and tour of your, of your uh, Gutenberg Bible uh, collection. I remember walking into the library one point and, as I recall, it's kind of the Bibles are all on the, not this one, but I mean, you have, there's a huge collection of Bibles um, that uh, are kind of on the left as you enter the, the main yeah. um, uh, East room. Um, so I, I it just, you know, that was 30 years ago when I saw that and I, or 40, I mean, it's, it's just am, am, amazing the depth of the collections that you have. And I'm sure the library is, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about is the library still accumulating collections um, or uh, individual books to fill out um, uh, perhaps a holes in like your children? And you have an extensive children's uh, book collection from early children's books um, or and probably many other fields. But uh, can you address that? Sure, of course. Um, we are still acquiring. We're not sort of a frozen collection. Um, and I'll say... You know, so the the current you know uh, Morgan Library and Museum is kind of the title we go by. Um, there are departments, uh, curatorial departments for printed books and bindings, where I am, uh, literary and historical manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, old master drawings, modern and contemporary drawings, photography, and um, ancient Western Asian seals and tablets. So we have. You know, it's a very extensive collection. It's not just uh, printed book material. Mm -hmm. um, but all all departments, you know, are still collecting. The contemporary drawings and photography are very new collections. We also have medieval, we also have music manuscripts department, um, which also is a little bit of a, those three are the sort of like the post-Morgan departments that were created over the last several decades based on other uh, collections being given and donations and acquisitions. Um, but we are still acquiring. Um, last week, uh, no, two weeks ago at Sotheby's here in New York, there was a major sale of a Renaissance uh, library from a private collector in Chicago um, that we did fairly well at mm -hmm. uh, and got 14 things. So I'm, I'm very eager to, once we pay the bill, to then go over to Sotheby's and get our books. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we are. And so it is, um, you know, both between, you know, the big book fairs that happen across the country and the booksellers 
you know, every Tuesday, I'm sure as many of you know, with all the lists that come out on Ex Libris and direct mails and everything, um, you know, a good deal of time is spent just like combing through, looking for things that are interesting that we can add to the collection. And for printed books, you know, we go from Incunabula to today. We're, we're extending the collection into the 20th and 21st century. Morgan did not buy, you know, modern literature. He didn't really uh, uh, buy books from his own period for the collection. He had those to read in his home, but they were not sort of collection material. Um, but so we're we're going into the 21st century with things like the archive for the Man Booker Prize, the English uh, Literary Prize. Um, we have uh, from the last, I forget however many decades of the prize, like judges' copies, annotated copies, mm. awards, uh, ephemera and material um, into artist books, um, but still keeping up, you know, acquisitions of early printed books in Cannabula, Renaissance, which are the, like what I really work on, um, into the 19th century children's books um, that are the focus of uh, two other curators in the department are sort of more the modern end of things. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, still very much developing the collection, yeah. um, and seeing how we can, you know, particularly now start to, uh, you know, represent other concerns in the collection that have not have been ignored so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and uh, see a few questions. I see some, some very, uh, some, um, uh, very uh, favorable comments about your talk, but I'll go to the questions. Um, the first Gutenberg Bible appears to have a lot of red lines or rubrication. Was this uh, added by the restoration or part of the original printing? I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you. Um, it's not part of the original printing. Um, that would have been added by hand later if the first purchaser of the Bible paid to have it done. Um, and I'll say I just put into the chat a very long list of a lot of uh, website links, basically to the Morgan website, but about sections on the architecture, on Bell Green, um, and on Morgan collection history. Okay. Um, but I can also send those to you. If you're interested, I can send them to you separately and you can- Yeah, you, uh, if you can. I don't always uh, uh, deal with the chat uh, material very um, well. Uh, yeah, I'd appreciate that. So I can then send it out to everybody. Um, let me, let me. Uh, so the, uh, um, on the vellum copy, you know, there are ruling lines that kind of more or less underline each line of text and then frame the margins. Um, those are a typical feature of sort of mid 15th century Bruges illumination. Um, but I'm a little bit, thinking they might be 19th century Paris mm. Mm. Um, because I, I, a lot of times there's no, um, the ink that goes from the 19th century Paris vellum onto the 15th century Mainz vellum. Um, we can't tell if it's different. Like it seems to appear the same under spectral analysis and, you know, it's so fine. Um, it's very hard to tell. So I'm leaning more towards that being part of the 19th century restoration, mm -hmm. restoration yeah. um, than original. But that is, you know, for certain styles of illumination, that is a typical feature of medieval illumination. I I thought I read in the bookseller of Florence, which you may have put a wonderful book, um, that uh, sometimes in the printed books uh, at that time when printing was replacing manuscripts that they put lines in to make it kind of look more like the manuscript books, uh, lines, you know, so they were they weren't needed because you're just printing yeah. it, but they were, but it was to kind of replicate the uh, what people were used to. Now that may not have been done by Gutenberg, but I think it was done by maybe some of the printers at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, like usually that does uh, that comes in the decoration. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the second, the, the, once the second you buy stage, the book, not by the printer pay. itself. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And whether that's, you know, um, to make it look more like something that the person was used to in terms of right. illuminated initials and right. ruling lines, 
um, mm-hmm. you know, is 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 her further question. So let me see if I can read this. My eyesight's not great. In line with J.P. Morgan's interest in Bibles and Christian historical print culture, beginning with the Elliott Bible, did he continue to collect many of the Bibles and related religious publications printed in indigenous languages? So do you have other other <clears throat> Bibles? Mm-hmm. Um, we have some material, and I'll say that just this past Friday, we opened we opened an exhibition called Morgan's Bibles on the history of sort of Pierpont's biblical collection from the cuneiform flood tablet up to the 1910 Book of Common Prayer that he sponsored and and Bible that he sponsored. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you can look online and see kind of information about that and um, some material there. Um, we did mainly through, again, sort of no real... Um, direction of Morgan's himself, because a lot of what he, again, was acquiring were like collections, either from an individual collector or that a book dealer, you know, put together for him. Um, But we do have uh, editions of kind of catechisms, uh, Book of Common Prayer, um, other Christian sort of missionary texts that have been translated into multiple uh, indigenous languages, um, even a couple, uh, several printed in Montreal or Quebec City. Excuse me, goodness. Um, we don't have, there, there are several for sort of a lot of the uh, Northeastern U.S. languages. Um, I, I I can picture a couple of Mohawk editions at the moment in my head, um, but we were never very strong and we are not strong in Latin American indigenous languages. We don't have the Nahuatl catechism um, or any Nahuatl uh, prayer books. Um, But these were all sort of uh, Southern or uh, J. Pearson and company to um, in Quaritch um, would put together collections of sort of a history of the Bible or a history of the Book of Common Prayer that would have multiple editions um, of these things for Morgan then you know, to buy en masse to get, oh, the entire history of, uh, you know, certain different, like, aspects of of scriptural history. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of that comes through, you know, these bigger collections, not Morgan saying, you know, I need a copy of, you know, this book in this language. And there are major uh, biblical works that Morgan never seem to go after, never seem to buy, the Bay Psalm book being a prime example. We also don't have a first edition of the Luther New Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the September or December Testament um, was never anything that we acquired. And for, you know, a critical work in terms of the development of Western scripture, that's one of them. Um, Mm -hmm. But it, you know, so there are still some like major holes in Morgan's collection and just the way he went after things and, you know, things are always going to fall through the cracks when you do it. Right. Right. Um, Question here. Could you discuss early researchers using the collection, which, which also kind of brings to mind the the, the current use of the library for research. But um, so I guess researchers during the period uh, before 1924 and maybe then how it changed after it became a more public institution. Of course. Um, so before 1924, um, it was very much restricted to academics who had some connection and knew someone who knew Morgan or knew Bell Green. Um, you know, it was a very personal sort of, you had to know them to be able to get to come into the Morgan to do, to look at one of the books or manuscripts. Um, in 1924, uh, when we became then the Pierpont Morgan Library as a public institution, um, what was Morgan's house at 36th and Madison was torn down. And by 1928, uh, the building we call the Annex now um, was open, and it included a gallery space and a reading room. Um, Bell wanted to be sure there was a specific space for readers to come in and see material. Um, again, you know, it was a lot of academics with certain credentials, but Bell was also adamant that 
classes and students have access to the material um, more through sort of a show and tell classroom setting than maybe coming independently to look at the material. Um, but she has, in archives, we have um, lists of some of the books and manuscripts she would pull out for like Columbia University classes in medieval art history and some of the major manuscripts that she would show them um, for that. Um, she also was very uh, passionate about these works being sort of available and put a lot of effort into creating, again, this was in the 30s and 40s, um, microfilms of primarily the medieval manuscripts. Um, and each a copy, um, every manuscript that was microfilmed, a copy was sent to the Huntington Library in California, and I think also to the British Library and maybe the Vatican to be sure they were available in Europe and also the West Coast so that if you couldn't get to New York, you know, hopefully someone would be able to have access. So, you know, she had a definite plan um, for access. And with the uh, 2006 piano rest, uh, expansion, we we still have our reading room um, up on the third floor. Um, you don't have to have letters of recommendation anymore to come visit. You just have to uh, fill out the form online and select an appointment, but the collection is there to be used um, for undergrads, graduates, actors, authors, writers, musicians um, to come look at material, um, at least for my department. You know, very little is restricted. We're not going to say no to too much unless, you know, um, if an undergrad wants to come see a Goober Bible just because they want to see a Bible, they can go look at the one in the case in the library. But there are a few materials that are because of their fragility or certain considerations, like you need to be able to see the thing in person. Um, we might say no if you don't uh, have like a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. But Understood. it is it is otherwise, the collection is online um, on our website for a library catalog. The full collection is there. You can see everything. You can request to see material um, if you come to New York and come to the Morgan for an appointment. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, she was ahead of her time then as far as public access was concerned, it seems. Um, that's certainly uh, where uh, the direction of libraries is going. Yeah, that's um, one of the things the exhibition is going to bring out and why it's, you know, called a librarian's legacy, really showing her importance in the field of librarianship uh, particularly kind of in, in you know, early 20th century America, where she was, you know, with Melvin Dewey and a few others, one of the most famous librarians in the country. Mm -hmm. There was a question here about why would, was the um, uh, one of the folio, uh, uh, Shakespeare folios deacquisition? I guess it was a, a fourth folio, maybe not considered quite as important, but... Uh, we also deaccessioned the first folio. Oh. Uh, uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, uh, there was a point in the library history when deaccessioning like duplicate copies um, in order to get something we didn't have was a common practice. Um, you know, a lot a lot of things were deaccessioned. Thankfully, not a Gutenberg Bible, but a Shakespeare first folio is sort of, you might think a strange choice, um, but the decision that was made um, and yeah, so so depending upon, you know, administration and the board of trustees at a certain point, you know, that idea of like trading material um, mm -hmm. was a lot more prevalent at a certain point. Right. Well, if they want to see a first photo, they can always go to go to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, so, um, the 120 or whatever it is. Yeah, right. So uh, do you have a, uh, a recommended book on uh, that details the building of the collection. I know you just mentioned the book that has just been published, and this yeah. question probably was written before you uh, mentioned that book. But is you mentioned something else called the Personal Librarian? Is that um, a, is that a book by? Well, there's. Uh, I mean, Bookman's Paradise um, is really on the building, not necessarily the things. Some of the material in it comes up, but it's really on. The physical building of Understood. the Orton Library. Um, the Personal Librarian by uh, Marie Benedict and uh, Victoria Christopher Murray um, is a very popular book at the moment. Like New York Times bestseller, the authors for you know two years have been making the media rounds. Um, but it is historical fiction, so oh. the collection comes up in there some, 
but not, you know, in true factual uh, reality. Was that the um, book on, that's not the, that's a different book from the book on Belle Green by uh, LaPierre. Uh, right, but they're both uh, historical fictions. Yes, I see. Okay. Yeah. Alexandre LaPierre uh, came out in French two or three years ago. And I think the English translation came out either at the end of last year or the beginning mm -hmm. of this year. Okay. Um, but Personal Librarian um, came out two years ago. Um, but, but you know, historical fiction, but has become like a much more popular work. Um, the only real, you know, real biography of Belle de Costa Green um, is by Heidi Arizone and is called um, An Illuminated Life. Um, and so it's, you know, what the, what you can appropriately call just the one true biography so far mm -hmm. of Belle Green. Um, in terms of the history of the collection, um, there is an older publication uh, that you can probably get in uh, secondhand bookshops or on Biblio or ABE books um, called In August Company. And it was sort of our highlights catalog and highlights exhibition, I think from the 90s. Um, the big exhibition we did kind of before the renovation and closure for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but um, until uh, I think um, later this year, there's going to be another sort of highlights catalog come out, but that's not going to be give you a holistic picture of the collections at the Morgan. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, I don't, there's not like a great single resource for sort of history of um, the entire collection. It's sort of bits and pieces in the uh, Bell biography, uh, the Gene Strauss biography of Pierpont Morgan. Um, Gene Strauss was the first woman, uh, the woman who discovered that Bell Green was black, actually. Um, in that biography, she covers some of Morgan's acquisitions uh, in there. Um, but there's not sort of a single kind of history of the collection cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I somewhat there's a book on the, the the building of the Huntington Library and how he bought whole collections yeah. and then we did the collections. It seems like Bell Green acted. Um, I mean, it was a similar approach, but not quite. Uh, it was a little more. It was a little more focused. It yeah. seems to me in Morgan's uh, uh, approach, and she acted as the weeder before they actually paid for him. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> there is a question here about, well, considering the acquisitions, how about the acquisitioning some of your other Gutenberg? So has that ever been discussed? But I, 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 I'm thinking that they're all so enough different that you don't really want to get rid of any of them. Uh, it's getting, you know, uh, museum trustees, you know, today are quite rightly incredibly leery of deaccessioning. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have to go through, you know, multiple hoops to prove, particularly with modern books, you know, that's, that's, you know, what we're thinking of, you know, if we need any deaccessioning, um, you know, modern first editions are a little bit easier to prove like 100% dupl uh, duplicateness um, than looking at some of those three Gutenberg Bibles where you're like, you know, just mm -hmm. seeing them, you're like, oh, these are all totally different. You can't call these duplicates yeah, exactly right um you know so um but yeah I, I think until even until the 80s we were deaccessioning or trading books with book dealers in order to kind of like build up or mm -hmm. get something you know very art museum-y kind of practice uh you know trade a lesser edition for a better one right right so here's a question from uh marty green who's uh one of our members and a, fa a fabulous collector of of uh, Arctic uh, exploration in his own right. Uh, he's asked about the relationship of Morgan to uh, Edward Curtis and the North American Indian publication. So I think I just, there was some I, perhaps some I just controversy want to say in also that. that uh, oh, here we go, Marty. Yeah, I yeah. 
of course, uh, Kurt, uh, Pierpont uh, funded Curtis in 1906 for $75,000 for his work on a North American Indian. And even after Pierpont died in 1913, the funding was continued. And uh, eventually 280 sets of the uh, uh, 20 volume work were published and a, a significant number were left with the Morgan Library and all the uh, un, un, uh, un, uh, uh, all, all the loose prints, but apparently they were deaccessioned in the 30s for a thousand dollars. And yeah. I, my the question is, uh, did Bill Green do this? Uh, and do you have a set of the North American Indian? They're now selling uh, at auction for more than two million dollars each. Yeah, um, we do. We we have set number one. Um. And yeah, the extra copies. Um, I don't. I don't know entirely if kind of the rights to those copies came to the Morgan, to the Pierpont Morgan Library for Bell Green to be in charge of, or if they stayed with Jack Morgan uh, Pierpont Jr. Um, but I know that a lot of them, um, you know, had to be sold that little because no one wanted them at the time. Um, and because they had sat in the basement for so long, a lot of them had significant moisture and mold damage. Hmm. Um, so it really was, um, I don't, I don't know how many copies, you know, out of that, you know, we inadvertently destroyed by just leaving them in a basement because, um, yeah, they were unsellable at the time. Uh, Pierpont and Jack gave copies away to a lot of libraries and universities in Europe because no one in America wanted them um at the time so yeah now now it's a little bit different story mm -hmm. this is a question i think you probably i don't know it, it it relates to um uh whether morgan collected grammatical or or or, or textual uh, works that were connected to the bibles um yeah, for example, uh, Eliot printed a grammar related to missionary work. So there was, you know, I think oftentimes, yeah. um, you know, in connection with the uh, creation of a uh, of a Bible in a different language, there was, uh, you know, there would kind of be a dictionary, almost a dictionary created along with it. Um, I'd have to look in the catalog. I don't entirely know off the top of my head, you know, what there is. Um, I would think, again, because of the way, you know, book dealers would put together collections for mm -hmm. Morgan, you know, they might include some of this material that are very much, you know, supplementary and supportive to uh, the primary concern of whatever Bible edition. Right. Um, um, but I can't think of any off the top of my head that are like that. I can think of, you know, other... The only the grammatical thing I can think of at the moment is sort of like the Aldo Manuzio um, Greek grammars that were printed with like the Greek Psalter um, that he did around uh, 1499 and 1500. Um, mm -hmm. But that's sort of a different mm -hmm. thing than sort of the uh, uh, biblical translations and right. that dictionary work. Right. Okay. Well, you've uh, given us a good reason to come to uh, probably to delay our trip to uh, New York City until your um, till the exhibit on Bell Green is open. So um, um, we'll um, uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Book Club of Washington and all of the people that are on uh, that have, uh, uh, have attended today's lecture for your really um, wonderful and illuminate illuminating and illuminated um, uh, talk on uh, the Morgan Library.